guys, there's just an export button. On. So today, we are going to be looking at automating the sending of email and of text messages. It would be great if you could, like, you're doing some process, maybe getting some information off the web, and it takes three or four seconds per line. You've got a bunch of lines to pro bunch of lines to process. Let this thing run, and you want to look at a ham sandwich. And when you're done, you know, when it's done, have it send you a text message so you can send it, come back and get back to work. That's what we're going to cover today, as well as how to send uh, email. Folks, we're going to be automating email through Gmail. So the chapter of the book is it has some very specific information on how to do it with uh, Outlook. How many of you use Outlook? Yeah, like order it. So that will be really helpful. In fact, it's probably even slicker to use Outlook if you're an Outlook user. But if you're not an Outlook user, that's a lot of overhead to say, I've got to install Outlook and remember to be able to send email. So I'm going to show you the more general way. The textbook has a pretty good job of covering how to do it with Outlook. So I'm going to leave that to you for the textbook. However, if you're in Gmail, well, I'm going to my Gmail account. I hope I don't have anything embarrassing in my Gmail account. Whew, nothing. Okay, good. So, we need to enable kind of less secure access to your Gmail account for Excel to be able to send an email through Gmail. Uh, let's see, how do we do that? Gmail, less, less secure apps. Allowing less secure apps to access your account. So if you're afraid of allowing less secure apps to access your account, you can sit back and watch. Or you could kind of go along with me to set the less, less secure setting now and then reset it back after class. I just you know, do this like a couple of times a year, and so I forget how to do it. Change account with secure. Option one. Well, option one is to use a more secure app. That's not an option for us. Option two, change your settings to allow. Go to the less secure app section in my account. Hmm. Maybe that link will take me straight there. So where did I find this? Yeah, no, I did that. But my question is, how do you find it? I said Gmail less secure apps, and it's the first link. It's the first link that I follow. And that gives me a link. Less secure apps. Oh, and that takes you right there. Turn on access for less secure apps. Presumably, if you've never done this before, it'll say turn off. It'll already be checked to turn off. Is that right? Your default was on. It was on. It was turned on. All right. For you. Anyone else gone there? And it says it already says turn off. Yeah. So to follow the example today, you'll need to click turn on access for less secure. Then that should that should allow you to do what we're doing. All right. Oh, recording something. That's great. Oh, in Learning Suite, we've got a file to download. In fact, we have two files to download for today. So the learning suite and find today's schedule. And we're going to download both the send email workbook and the email message text file. Where's this at? This is the learning suite on today's date, November, Wednesday, November 30th. Oh, yeah. <gasps> that was December. It's the most magical month of the year. For this email text message, I'm going to right click the link and say save link as because I actually want that to be saved as a Yep. There is another option to do the uh, insecure thing. Apparently there's another option. What is it? Do app passwords. So I use a two-step verification with my phone number when I log in as Gmail. Yep. But I have a few uh, app passwords that there's a long generate password that goes with my account. They can log into that as well. So Interesting. You can generate a token. Yeah, it's not that generate token. Thinking about the code that we're about to execute, I just don't know where I would put that. So let's go through it this way. You use your email and you use this password until you get through. Oh, really? So it's pretty simple. Let's go ahead and do this, but I want to see that right after class. Okay. So that way I can test it before I show everyone how it works, only to have it somehow fail because what else? So that's really interesting. I'm glad to know that. Okay. Let me go ahead now and open my send email workbook. So here's the data that I have in my send email workbook. What it really is, is this is some data that I downloaded from the National Highway Transportation Safety Bureau. 
This is like information about complaints that were filed with the Bureau. So here's, just look at this first record. Incidentally, folks, all the email addresses here are fictitious. They all go to me. So, yeah, if you get, it's funny because every once in a while, it'll be like, you know, weeks after I've gone over this course, I'll realize, oh, someone's actually practicing with that because I've gotten, you know, 80 emails saying that uh, someone's very concerned about the trouble I'm having with my 1990 Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> so, it might be a good idea for you to put an email address that you have access to here in the email column. That way, when you send the email, you can see it come through instead of relying on you know, coming through to me. Okay, so here we got someone, Evelyn Sabo. The name is fictitious too, by the way. Uh, the city, I think, is correct. This really is a complaint that happened in Finksburg, Maryland. The letter was sent in February of 2000. It was for some Chrysler vehicle, a Jeep Cherokee, 1990 Jeep Cherokee. The fail date was in 1992. So it was a 1990 Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> this is interesting. It failed in 1992. When did the letter come in? 2000. I'm not sure I believe that. That might be some data problem. That's okay for what we're doing. It doesn't have any great data. There's some problem. So here it said, hey, the problem is somewhere in the hydraulic brake system. It's some component tripping. There were two injured, and then we get a description of the, of the problem. The paint is peeling off in sheets, and the brakes don't slow the vehicle. You know, I mean, of those two, I'm thinking the brakes is the kind of more critical one here. I could believe the paint peeling off would be kind of a problem too, but the brakes don't slow the vehicle constantly. Sometimes when you push on the brake, it's like it doesn't have brakes at all, but the Maybe he was texting this while he was driving. <laughs> That's kind of, what the heck, the brakes don't work anyway. I think some of these summaries have gotten truncated somewhere, but anyway. But here's the thing. Here, here's the setting. Imagine that you, know, you, you have gotten an internship at the National Highway Transportation Safety Bureau. Well, maybe, it's, maybe it's your job. Someone has said, we found out there's, a, there's some, these are some problems that we need you to look into. And so you know, contact these people, let them know you're looking into them, if they want to give you the information, let them know that. So send, send these people an email. So you're thinking, great, I don't want to send all these emails. I'd rather have the computer send these emails. And so that's what we're going to do. So the whole idea here is that in, in that template that we downloaded, is like the email that we want to send. It's like a mail merge for emails that we're going to look at. And there are, of course, other ways to do a mail merge in email. This is like a general tool. Once you see how to send an email, there are other reasons why you might want to send an email. And so you know, here's another thing that you might do. Especially since you can automate your Internet Explorer, you can have some, you can have some process that is, you know what, every half hour or so, it goes to KSL and checks for a certain number of things. In fact, one of my former students was like, uh, he traded like he bought and sold expensive instruments. And you know, he, would, he, would, he, would, he would look for deals on KSL where people don't realize the value of what they're selling. And then he would buy it and then he would you know, sell it. He knows the market to sell it to. When someone is selling an antique saxophone on KSL, they are not going to get what that thing's worth. You know, he knows where to sell it where he can. Anyway, he actually did a project. He came and he just came in to brag. He came to my office to brag. So I just got to show you this. He set it up so that every 30 minutes it would check KSL for a certain search, and then if it was if it met certain criteria, it would send him a text message. And so you get a text message, go, oh wow, there's this you know antique saxophone for sale. I only want five thousand dollars for it. Anytime I see a saxophone that's for sale for five thousand dollars, I'm moving on. I'm not writing five thousand dollars. <laughs> this guy looks at it and goes, I think it's worth ten thousand easy. And so you know he immediately bought it and then sold it within a couple of days for $11,000. And so, but that was, it was possible because he could set Excel to sit there and do the work of looking every so often and then have it send him a text message when a certain condition was met and uh, he's able to capitalize. So, yeah, I'm thinking how long, when I was a student, it took me to earn $5,000, it was like a year is how long it took. So, I kind of wish someone was teaching this class when I was a student. 
Actually, the language wasn't around when I was a student. So, <laughs> so let's take a look. Nor was the internet. So, a whole lot of help. So. <laughs> okay. So here is. Let's see. Okay, so here's that. Here is the uh, the message. To, what do they call it? It was called email message.txt. It's a very sincere message. You can see. So this is set up so that the first line here is going to be the it's going to be the subject of the email that we're going to send. You know, if I you know I have a 1999 Ford F350, and if I got an email that said problem with your 1999 Ford F350, I would open that email. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I probably would. Someone knows I have a 1999 Ford F-350. Okay. Dear Gov, when I heard about the trouble you had with your 1999 Ford F-350, I was deeply troubled. I've recently been assigned to your case. You wrote the thing in the year 2000. I'm now um, assigned to your case. What is the government, the federal government? Uh, I wanted to give my contact information to let you know that the National Highway Transportation that takes these takes let's see, is currently evaluating the make and system. So like the Ford brake something. Ford, what would system be? The Ford anti-skid system for a possible recall. We would like to provide any more information about the incident you experienced back in 2000. Please don't hesitate to contact me. But don't text and drive, sincerely. So and then these are the things that we're trying to find. So that's the idea. We're going to send kind of a personalized email, uh, but it's not going to be all that personal. All right, so let's take a look at the code that we have then inside the send mail workbook. Let me go ahead and save this. Save as. Save this as fall 2016. Fall 16. Okay, so there's a module here called mod Gmail. It's also called module one. What's in module one? Look like an example, getting this started. Oh, that's nice. And then, uh, so let's take a look at mod Gmail. So this is a function that is set up to send a message through Gmail. We are going to send it an email address that we're sending it to, an email address we're sending it from, password that we're using to authenticate, the subject of the message, the body of the message, and then optionally the path to a file that we want to attach to the message. This is a function and it returns a boolean. Tell me what, well, first of all, tell me what that means. Returns a boolean means it's going to return true or false. What, what sense does that even mean? What sense does it even mean for it to send true or false? If it returns true, what do you think that means? Yeah, it was sent. Does it mean the person received it? No, it means the outgoing mail server that we contacted accepted the message for delivery. And it's going to try to deliver it. Uh, if it sends false, then it will mean it didn't deliver it. So that's nice. We get some signal back and forth. Why might it not why might it not take it? Spam filter. Ah, maybe a spam filter. I've never known an outgoing mail server to check it for spam before it accepts it for delivery. Usually what will happen is the message server will accept it, and then I might look at it and go, yeah, I'm not sending it. But it'll at least, it'll at least get the message. So I don't think a spam, would, I don't think a spam filter would stop, would, uh, stop it. Uh, probably not a firewall. It's kind of unusual to have firewalls protecting what data is going out. Firewalls are usually designed to protect stuff coming into the organization. But you know, there could, the point is, there could be something that's keeping my uh, a network connection from actually even reaching the server. That could, that could stop it. That's one main thing that would cause this to fail. The second main thing is that if I'm sending an email that's not properly formed, so that outgoing mail server is going to look at that thing and say, before it accepts it, it's going to say, can I route this message? And if the email address is malformed, it's going to go, I can't even send this message. I'm not even taking it. I mean, I know now that I'm not giving this to anybody, so I'm not even taking it. And so that will cause it to fail as well. But the nice thing is, this will give us a signal back so we can know, did, at least did the message was it you know, sent to go out? Okay, good. 
Okay, so let's just kind of look at the code here. So again, uh, rather than kind of go through building this code up from scratch, I don't know anyone who builds this code from scratch. Where do you get this code? <coughs> you copy it from somewhere on the internet or you copy it from this assignment. And so, but I just want to at least kind of talk through it. There are two objects, similar to when we're working with a database connection, we had one object that just was the connection object, and then when we were bringing records back from the database, we had another object that handled the record set. It's kind of the same situation here. I've got two different objects. One handles the connection to the mail server. It is called the CDO configuration. CDO stands for something. Common data object, I think, but now I'm not sure. And so this is a configuration to connect to a mail server. And so I'm, I'm binding a variable to that called config. My other object here is the message, and then once I have a valid connection, I'm going to use that connection to dispatch the message. So these are the two objects that I have to manipulate. Okay, so config refers to the, to the configuration, and so this is just everything it takes to get connected up to the mail server. So we've got to give it a parameter called send using, and that's going to be number two. Send using means we're specifying the, the host name and the port to communicate with the mail server. If I'm connecting to an, a Microsoft Exchange server, there's a different approach for that. But if it's a normal SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol server, which is by far the most common kind of mail server, then two is what you want. I then have to supply the host name. This gets me to the right machine. And then the port, this tells me which out of all the channels that machine might be listening to, it's listening on channel number 465, port number 465. We're telling it a one here. The authentication <laughs> approach is number one, meaning it's going to be basic authentication. Can you imagine that like back around the year 2000, Gmail didn't even require you to be authenticated to send a message? They would let anyone send a message. No username, <coughs> no password. You want to send a message? Here, email, send this message. Or here, Gmail, send this message. It turns out that most of our internet protocols were, de were designed for trusted networks. Um, internet's not a trusted network. What happened, incidentally, as soon as Google kind of made that, that process available? Yes, spam went crazy. In fact, in, in, in SMTP, you can send the message, and then you can say as a separate line, who did this message come from? Like, have you ever got a message from someone that message that purported to be from somebody that it wasn't really from? Yeah, because the, the, the protocol allows that. Google doesn't allow that anymore. So Google says, you're going to send a message, you've got to be an authenticated user. And so that's what, we have, that's what we're telling you here, is we're going to be authenticated. So from then is going to be your Gmail address that is used to authenticate. And we're passing that in. So from is going to be passed in. Password is your Gmail password. That's going to be passed in as well. Now, are we going to encrypt the traffic between this tool, between our Excel program that we're writing, and the Gmail server? And the answer is yes. In fact, <coughs> Gmail will not allow unencrypted traffic to send mail. It has to be encrypted for it to accept it. And so use SSL, um, secure socket layer, that says encrypt the traffic. This sets the fields up. That updates the fields. And now we are ready to move on to the message. Okay, so the message then says, this is now all the information about the message that I'm sending. Who are we sending it to? So it's gonna be an email address that we're sending it to. Who's it coming from? Folks, this is gonna be the same account that you're authenticating with. Here's where I could put any email address I wanted to. Would Gmail accept it if it had a different email address as being who it's from than was used to authenticate it? Yeah, it would accept it, but it would ignore it. It would just say, we know who this is from. This is from the person who just authenticated it. And so, it really doesn't, for this, it doesn't really matter what you put here. It's going to be substituted with whatever you use to authenticate. Uh, but it's something you can specify if the mail server you're working with doesn't, doesn't replace them. Subject and a body. You'll notice there's a text body property. That's what we're doing. We're sending plain text email. There's also some other properties here that I have left, just commented out, but left them here in case you wanted to play with them. There's an HTML body. So if you wanted to format the the email to look nice, you could structure it using HTML, and then you would put that into the HTML body and send the text. 
So you can configure that either way. And some other information to put in here too. Have you ever gotten an email message that when you replied to the message, it went to someone else, that, someone who didn't send it? The reply goes somewhere to, to besides who it got sent to? Yeah, you can do that right here. So you can specify another email address to reply to you. You can add an attachment here. It says, hey, if the attachment is supplied, we're just going to call the add attachment method of the message. This function is going to allow you to connect to attach how many attachments? Exactly one. Does this approach allow me to attach more than one file? Does this CDO approach for sending email allow me to attach more? Yeah, this is a method, add attachment. I can add attachment with that path. I can add attachment with another path. It's just that this function doesn't do that. This function is simplified. It just takes one. If you wanted to send more, you'd pass it an array or you'd pass it a collection of the files, and this would have to be a loop that goes through and processes each one of those. But this is just saying you can attach one file. If you want more, it'll take some extra work. All right. Now we are going to set the messages configuration. We're going to say this message has to get bound to a configuration object. And here's how we do it. It has a property called configuration, and we just set it to the config object that we defined up here. And once we have a message that has a configuration bound to it, we are ready to send the message. You'll notice that we're doing it inside an error trap. If there's an error, just keep right on moving. We try to send the message. If the error number is zero, what does that mean? Error number of zero is what error? No error at all. And so in this case, we're setting the name of the function equal to true. That means it was successfully sent. Otherwise, we're setting the name equal to false. And then we're going to print some information about the error <coughs> in the immediate window, really just for you in debug mode to be able to see what's going on. End of the error, or end of the error trap. We set the objects equal to nothing. Turns out Microsoft says that when you hit the end function, those objects will be released automatically. Sometimes they don't. It's not that sometimes these don't, it's that sometimes Microsoft hasn't been good at that. And so a lot of programmers say, yeah, I know Microsoft, you're going to release the memory for those objects. You say you're going to, but I want to make sure. And so it's just, all this does is it, it frees up the memory associated with those objects and releases it back to the operating system. These two lines are probably entirely unnecessary. Okay. So now I should, literally, I should be able to come here and say, send Gmail. Question mark, send Gmail, so it will print true or false. And then I can specify an email address, the subject, who it's from, my password, and we can send that message right here. We're not going to do that because I'd have to show you my password. And so instead, <coughs> we're going to write the code that will send this message. For that, we're going to come to the So, any questions on kind of the overview of this? Do I expect you to be able to write this function? No, that's why I gave it to you. Don't write this function, it's here. Use it. Um, would I expect you to say, you know what, I need to make some modifications to this, a little bit of work? Yeah, but at this point, I think you and Google should be able to come in and work to make some modifications. <coughs> All right, let's come back to module one. And I've just got a send mail subprocedure set up for us. We have several variables pre declared for us, because at this point, declaring variables is beneath you. It would be great if someone could have those variables pre declared, at least for our time here in class. And so now let's start by collecting the user's e uh, e um, username and password. You'll notice, folks, that we also have a form right here called form password. So that's Gmail account, we're asking for everything before that at gmail.com, and then your Gmail password. If I look at the OK button, it just is going to set proceed. Oh, I'm even using proceed. Me.hide. Ah, if we hit cancel, it is going to erase the password. That's how we'll know if they press OK or cancel. We'll check to see if, if the password is set. And if it is, we'll move on. Otherwise, we're going to quit. So let's go ahead and. and where, where are you? Is that on the form? This is, yeah, this is behind the OK button. Just don't click the OK button. Okay. Probably don't really need to look at that. I'm just kind of give you an overview so this isn't all coming out of left field. We're going to use this form now. All right. So I'm going to start off by saying the first thing I'm going to do is. Let's go ahead and open up and ask for the password. So, frm password dot show. Now, after it shows, the, the, the code is going to pause here until the user closes that user form. 
Remember, if the user presses cancel on that user form, it's going to wipe out the password. So whether they didn't put a password in or they pressed cancel, either one of those two, I'm going to have no password. If I have no password, is there any reason to proceed? No, so we'll just let me out. If frm password dot txt password dot value is blank or equals a zero length string, then exit sub. There is no reason to proceed. Get me out of here. Otherwise, at this point, I know I've got a password supplied. I'm going to assume that we have a username supplied as well. Actually, let's do the same thing here. If there's not a password, get me out of here. If there's not a username, get me out of here. Uh, it's called TXT account. Either one of those two things, I'm not moving on without it. Now, we have to realize that when the user types this in, they're not putting the at gmail.com. We're saying, hey, this thing is going to, it's only going to work with Gmail. It's configured to work with Gmail. And so that part has to be, that has to be supplied. So the user's not going to type that in. So let's go ahead and add that on at this point. So we've got a variable called PW for password, UN for username. Let's go ahead and set that right here. <coughs> UN equals FRM password dot TXT account. Concatenated with at gmail.com. Password equals FRM password. Dot txt password dot value. Actually, I want the dot value over here as well. It's a default property. It would work without it, but I like to have it. How are we doing so far, folks? This is this is this is nothing. This is not the first time you've seen any of the concepts we're talking about here. Okay. So now. I've got, I've got the, the credentials ready to authenticate. Now I need to build my message. Okay, so I've got something here called template. Let's just read the template in from, uh, from that file. We're going to assume that that file is named email underscore message.txt and that it's located in the same place that my the same place where my workbook is. Make sure I've got that saved in the right place. It's in downloads. Okay, so that looks like it should work. So I'm going to open up. And here's how I open a text file. I realize it used to be that I would have, by this time, I would have shown you, we would have played already with text files. All right, hang with me here, folks. Open, and then I've got to give it the full path of the file that I want to open. I'm going to read the path off the current workbook. That's going to make this more general. It won't be tied directly to this machine. So as long as I move this workbook and the text file together, wherever it goes, I should be able to get to it. So this workbook <coughs> dot path this workbook dot path is concatenated with right behind my head or something on this floor. Concatenated with <laughs> Backslash, and then what is it called? Email message. We're going to open that file for input as number one. And I'm going to close that file. Close number one. So it's this approach to opening files where I give the file a number. Goes back to the 1970s. It's really kind of a weird way to do it. We don't create an object that somehow has methods and properties working with that text file, which would be a more modern way to do it. We say that file is now open, it has a number, we'll use that number when we refer to that file. The reason we have to give it a number is because we have three or four files open at once. We have hundreds of files open at once, but we have to be able to know which one we're talking, read from this one, write to that one, and so forth. We're just going to do one at a time here. So now I want to say that the temp the variable template defined up above is going to equal, and then I want to read all of the data from that file. Input. See it's called input. I tell it how many characters I want to read. Let's say I want to read 100 characters. For 
from which file? File number one. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here in code to stop STO. I'm going to run this code from here, and we're going to see what we've got. I'm just going to check to make sure that that's working so far. User account, Alan. Little secret password. Okay, so now template should have some data in it. There it is. It's got the first 100 characters of that file. I could read one file, one character. I could read 10 characters, 100 characters. It's tell how many characters I want. Yep. What was the, what's, so I get the 100, the number of characters, what's the one? Do? The one is which file? Oh. This was opened as number one. Okay. I am reading from file number one. Now, how much of this file do I want to read? Maybe we want to read all of it. This kind of seems like a strange thing to read just a portion of that file. Why don't we read the whole thing? Here's the reason. When these when these statements were written, how much memory did we have to work with? Yeah, like a few thousand characters. That was all the memory of the program. How many did you have now? 16 billion. We had a few thousand back in the day. So we have a large file. You simply could not read the whole thing in memory at once. And so you'd say, well, read the next 10 characters, read the next 100 characters, then let's do something. It's still kind of nice now because now we've got some big files. How many of you ever had a file that was like gigabytes in size? Any of you put a file for that? Yeah. And so you can still kind of process those reasonably efficiently using this approach because you don't have to read the whole thing at once. But in this case, it's small. We want to read the whole thing. And so we're just going to tell it to read it all. How do we tell it to read it all? Not, it's close. So let's take a look. I'm going to execute this to open it again. So it turns out that there is a function called LOF, length of file. I tell it which number I want, and it tells me how many characters there are. 612 characters. And so I can replace this 100 with LOF1. However many characters there are in that. Now I should be able to print my template again. And now I've got the whole thing. <coughs> All right, how are we feeling about opening this file and reading it? Looking at that going, that's okay, we can do that? Do that. I'm actually amazed that I can remember all that syntax. I almost always have to go look at it somewhere to, to get it to change. Here we go. Okay. So now we need to say, you know what, we're processing, oops, we're processing this one at a time. So we need some kind of loop that is going to go across all of this. And by now, this loop is a loop that we've done 100 times. So that's a slight exaggeration. Probably have R set up here as an integer. Probably should be a long, but we'll stick with integer, that's fine. We'll say R equals two, do until, do I have a worksheet down for this? Oh, look, it's actually it's actually called data. It has a name. It's called data. So I can just say do until data dot cells row number r column number one dot value equal to zero next string. Increment r inside the loop. And so now whatever I have inside this loop is going to execute for each line that I have data. <coughs> Again, yeah, nothing new here. All right, so I think I've got a few variables that I want to read in. So I've got a model year. Let's look here. Let's, let's do these first three together. Model year, a make, and a model name. Model year, make, and model name. So let's assign those variables to some value. Model year equals, which column is my model year data in? Does anyone know? So let's set that one. Model year is in. Oh, they're not. Ooh, message sent is where I'm saying whether this thing was sent or not. We better look at column B to control this. Model year is K. Is that right? Model year. So that's column 11, or I'm just putting here K. Can you use max with a 
Uh, that would be, the question is, can I use next with a do until loop? I can, all the way until I run it. Well, let me have a syntax error. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do you need to change the line do until for R? Yeah. This should be column B. Yeah. It's column number one is blank to start with. So I'll put this in B. Or column two, either one will work. Okay, so we want the year, we want the make, and we want the model. <coughs> So I'm going to have a make div. My make is in column I. And then I've got the model itself, which is in column J. Well, while we're defining these variables, let's go ahead and keep doing them. That first name is one we're going to need. Presumably, I have one called first name up here. Yep, so we've got first name. Do you want to know where first name is? Column B. We've got year, make, and model, first name, make, and system. Make, we've got already, so we've got system. This is going to take a little more work. I'm going to push system off for a minute. Uh, but I will go ahead and plug in failure. And failure is, hmm, there's no column for the, for the fail year itself. We've got this fail date. So that's column L. How do I get the year off of a date expression? The right four. Ah, I can take the right four. Or I could ask for the year. There's a function called year. Does the model need to be long name? Uh, it might need to be. The question is what's the variable name here? Yeah, you're right. It's model name. Thank you. And there, there could be more, but you get the point, right? We're taking we're, we're taking the relevant data off of this line, putting a set of variables, and now we're ready to build the message from the template. So I'm going to come here and say message. I think I got a variable called message. Yep, message. Actually, let's do the let's let's do the. Yeah, let's go ahead and do message first. Message equals the template. I'm going to start off just by reading the fresh, unadulterated template into my message variable. Now I'm going to change message. Message is going to equal the template, but I want to start replacing stuff. Look at message. Look for something. Replace it with something. So I'm going to look for, we might we do this several times, so I might just copy this multiple times. I am looking for model year. Model year is going to, there's going to be the opening and closing angle brackets on each one, so for model year and replacing it with what? The variable model year. I'm looking for make, replacing it with what? The variable make name. Oh no, make is right. I'm looking for model name. Does it seem at all strange that the variable name is the same as the text we're looking for? Is that necessary in any way? It's just, it's, just, it's, just set, it's just set up that way to make my life a little bit easier. So I've taken the actual variable names that I'm using to hold these values, and I've put them inside the message that I'm working on inside of brackets. What else do I have to work with? 
first name and failure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop my code right here. We got another break one up here somewhere that was a stop one was downloading. Maybe I'll go ahead and stop my code and I'll run it again. Variable not defined. Oh, maybe it's, I'm sorry. Yeah, the letter isn't, it's not data, it's, it's letter is the code name. I gotta go change all my data. Should check that before I copy it. That make, did you see the mistake I made? I looked over here and thought, oh, the code name is data, but that's actually the, that's the what's displayed on the label of the sheet. The name I refer to this thing through code is letter. So everywhere that I was referring to the cell, I got a prefix with letter instead of with data. Any question back there? No? Try that again. I'm not really ready to use these yet, so it doesn't matter what I put in, as long as there's something. All right, so I should be able to now look at my message and it looks pretty good. So here's the message. Problem with your 1990 Jeep Cherokee, your Evelyn, when I heard about the trouble you had to carry with Jeep, we told that looks pretty good. Hey, how many of you have gotten an email message like this before? The tag was like un uh, unreplaced. You see, I got one like last week. I'm like, so I was like, oh, uh, whoops, that wasn't very sincere. <laughs> Okay, so now I mean, you get the point. We can figure out, we can fill in the rest of those tags you know, if we needed to. And depending on time, we may. Now, what's the problem? What's, what's wrong with this right here? This is part of my message, but it, when I send the message, this first line is not going to be in the message. The first line is going to be the subject. So let's go ahead and define the subject. I'm going to actually find out where this break happens. So how do I find out where that break happens? I've got a variable here called POS, short for position, that I'm going to use to figure out where that is. So I'm going to say, all right, position equals, what function should I use to find out where something is inside of a string? Function we've played with a few times in class. In string, I-N-S-T-R, starting at the first character, looking at my whole message, looking for what? I could look for deer. That'd probably be okay. But I want you to think more like programmers. There really is a character right there that you don't see in the file. It's, it's actually two characters. It's character number 10 and 13. In fact, sitting there in message, let's just see, how long is this? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, so like 30, no, like 37 down here. Listen, let me just look at the 37th character. In string, uh, mid, looking at message, looking at the 37th character and bringing back one character. That syntax error up here is not leaving me executing anything, so let me comment that out for a minute. Let's do the 36th character. There we go. 36th character is that E right there. I know that because if I do the 35th character, it's also an E, and if I do the 34th character, it's going to be that K. So 34, that's 34, 35, 36. So I want to know what the ASCII value of character number 36 is. So ASC 36. Lowercase e is character number 101. The next one, 37, is going to be, I think it's a character number. So let's look at 37 and ask what the ASCII value of that one is. It's character number 13. And the next one is character number 10. That's the two-character non-printable sequence that when like, 
again, a text editor sees that, it goes, oh, I don't, that, that's, that's not an instruction for me to print something. That's an instruction that says, go down a line and go back, and then start printing the rest of the characters. So the first of these two is character number 13. That's what's in number 37. That's the 37. That's character number 11. Right? The 37th one is character number 13. So what I want to do is I want to look for the first occurrence, starting at the, the first character, look in message, and look for character 13. And that will tell me which character it, which character, what do I expect position to be after I run this line? I think it should be 37. It is. So now I have told VBA here to look and find out where the first carriage return character is. And that's where I know that's the end of that first line. So when the, when the person's building the template, we just tell them, first line is the subject, everything else is the message. So now that I know that, I can set up my subject. Subject now is going to equal the leftmost characters of my message. How many characters do I want? Position minus one. Right? I want to end with a 36th character. And then my message needs to be the mid of message. Starting where? If I start at position, it's going to start with that 37th character. If I start at position plus one, it will be the 38th character, the line feed. So I want to do position plus two. I don't tell it how many characters it will bring the rest of the will bring the rest of the line. So now I'll execute those two lines. I should be able to look at my subject and get, yep, problem with your 99 key Cherokee, and then message. And then I get the whole rest of the message. Questions? Okay, at this point, I think I'm, I think I'm good. What do I have? I've got a message, I've got a subject, I've got a username, I've got a password, I've got a function to send it. <coughs> I don't know who I'm sending it to yet. So come up here to where I'm reading stuff in from my worksheet. I'm just going to make these other variables. I've got a variable up there, I think already called email. And that's in column four or column D. Email's up here. Apparently it's lowercase. So I'll need to run that line again. Maybe I should just stop and run it again. Oh, now I'll go ahead and put in my real credentials. Go, Alan. Type this match. Email. Oh, I don't want the year of email. Sorry. Copy the wrong one. I just want the value. There we go. So now I should be able to look at some of these. Email should be who I'm sending it to. Isworld at byu.edu. That's going to come to me. Hopefully, you have replaced at least the first two or three email addresses with an account that you can access so you can see if it works. Um, should I have a username? There's my username. Should I have a password? Oh, no, no password. <laughs> okay, I think I've got everything you need to send the message. So, do I have a variable to take to hear the response back yet? So, this is going to return, my call to, to send Gmail is going to return true or false. So, watch this. I'm going to say if send Gmail. Wait a minute. Can I put a function call right here in an if statement? Yeah, because it returns true or false. What I have to have in the if statement is something that evaluates the true or false. Before it can know if it's true or false, it has to go run the function. 
Let's see what it returns. This will work pretty well. If send Gmail, who am I sending it to? Email. Who am I sending it from? Username. What's the password? PW. What's the subject? Subject. What's the body? Message. And there's no attachment. In fact, if I if if I'm able to send the message that I would like to record that the message went out. <clears throat> so I'm going to write out to column number A the current time. So if I send it out, if, if, the, if the message is accepted, I'm going to write the current date. That way I'll know that one's been taken care of. Don't send it again. Just today, I got an email from someone at BYU Idaho asking me to do a survey. About 10 minutes later, I got the same email again. We'd like to avoid that, so do something to flag it. Of course, we still have to write the code that says, hey, take a look and see if there's a value there and don't, don't reprocess it. But at least we're getting set up to do that. But what if it fails? What do I want to put there? I want to put something else there. I don't really care what goes there. How about just fail? That way I won't try to send it again, whether it went through or whether it didn't go through. If it failed to go through, then we have to. Whew, that should work. Should we try it? If send email, send email. F5. Looks like it. it uh, well, let's see. What did it put over here? We read out the date, so I think it sent that. Let's take a look and see if it went through. Come back to the Gmail. Pretty sure you have four or five of these. I think. Let's see, that will have gone to my university account, and it may take a minute to come through. Or I may have to go to my university account. Problem with your 1996 Chevy Blazer. Problem with the 93 Hunt. Someone is like letting a loop actually run. Stop that. Sorry, I was just going for it. Oh, they're still coming. Delightful. Anyway, they're working. That's good news. Sort of. <laughs> Okay, probably I get my Gmail account by now too. It's going to take a while, but it should be. Anyway, we can see him. We can see him again. Okay, so far so good. How are we doing? You get the you get the point here. Now we spent all our time doing Gmail. How about or how about how do we send a text message for this? Well, I have an unlimited text message by now, too. I guess I need to use my image. Here's the thing, folks. What we're going to do to send a text message is we're going to use, we're going to leverage the fact that every carrier, virtually every carrier, has, a has an email to text message gateway. If I know how to format an email address and send it, then it can actually go as a text message to someone's phone. So by the time it's done with this whole loop, I want to do another send Gmail. This one I won't care if it goes through or not, we'll just see it. The email address I'm going to send it to is actually going to be my telephone number. Now, I think I've got a procedure built for this already. Yeah, I've got a function called get address. I give it a 10-digit telephone number and I give it a carrier. And it will properly format the email address for the major carrier. How do I do that? It's really simple. You come over here, look in the system info. Here's what they are. Here's the prefix for all these. If you're Sprint, it's messaging.sprintpcs.com. So it's just a 10-digit phone number at messaging.sprintpcs.com. That's how you send a text message for email. And this function will, what was the function called? Get address? 
I give a 10 digit phone number. Here's my cell phone number 801 where is this one? 372 0685. This function is defined inside the mod Gmail function. You don't have to look, you don't have to go there, you have to modify it. You can look at it, you want to look at it, you can. So there's the phone number, and then the carrier is Sprint. And that should bring back the email address that will send a text message to my phone. Feel free to put your own email address, your own text message. <laughs> okay. So now when this thing is done sending, I'm going to send a Gmail to that using the same username and password that I've already authenticated with that lets me send messages. The subject is going to be uh, done. And then the message, master, I have completed your bidding. And await further orders. So, oh, I can get my phone. My phone's in my office. You won't hear it ring from there. Does anyone else? I mean, it's a little more effective if you can like, hear the message come in. You know what? Not mind us. I guess we'd be recording it you know, for everyone to see on the internet. So, I just didn't have extra. Do we have any volunteers? <laughs> okay, give me your number. Uh, okay, two, two five three five one four. Five nine eight seven. Five nine eight seven. Carrier? <laughs> and uh, shoot, T Mobile. T Mobile was T dash mobile. Alright. Turn your turn your sound up so we gotta hear it and maybe you've already gotten some on the way by the anxious students. Let's say it took long enough. Usually takes 10 15 seconds. Oh, yeah. Hey, turn your sound up so we can hear it. That's the whole point. Master, I've completed your bidding and awaits further orders. Okay, so I can see this is pretty true, and so it went through. Is your sound up? Now it is. Okay, okay so. Only got the one message. Another one's coming, just another one. Oh, the second one came, but I think I didn't have the sound. <laughs> One more. Wow. There we go. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> Let's hear it for our very brave folks. Okay, what's the downfall to this? You've got to know the carrier to be able to send the message. Usually at about this point, someone says, well, couldn't you just write a loop that sends it to all the carriers? I mean, only one of them has the number. The answer is, yeah, you could do that, but that's kind of abusive. You really shouldn't do that. So uh, go through the effort to actually find out the carrier and then use the space. And but the nice thing is you can send it this way free of charge. Yeah? Wouldn't you probably get blacklisted? Like most, most of these, like, I would assume the big carriers would have some sort of rare name on their firewalls that would... Here's a question. Would you get blacklisted if you sent a bunch of text messages that really weren't going through? Repetitively, if I kept hitting on a certain carrier. I don't know the answer to that. I have never tried it. Oh, believe me, I've done things that have got me blacklisted. But just not that. <laughs> so, yeah. Can you tell us some story? What's that? There. Can you tell us some story? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you a story. It's actually, you're kind of done here with the content, so we'll conclude, we'll conclude with the story. I was... Uh, kind of a brand new professor, and I was doing some research at the time. It was about year 2001, and uh, it was a pretty new phenomenon that we had a thing called a shop bot. I don't think we would call them shop bots anymore, but the idea is you can go to one of them was like adall.com and you say, I want to buy a book. You put in the ISBN number, and it would give you 24 sites that were selling that book, and it would compare the prices side by side. This is a new phenomenon. And I was interested to find out how well these different shop bots characterized the market. Were they biased? Or did they do a pretty good job of characterizing what the market was like? And so I wrote a program that every morning at 2 o'clock in the morning, it would go and get the 
list of the best-selling books from the New York Times website, and then it would ask one at a time for the prices for each one of those ISBNs from like 12 different shop clubs. And about, about two weeks into the study, we just do it every morning, about two weeks into the study, one of the shop bots just quit responding. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I happened to be watching when this shop bot just went out of business. And I mentioned that to a colleague. I think, I think it was uh, ISBN.nu was the shop bot. And I mentioned to a colleague, he said, no, I was just there today. And he went back and said, I can get to it. He went to the university. I'm like, huh? And I went and checked for mine. I can't get to it. They didn't know who I was, but they do all these requests in the morning. You know, hundreds of requests were coming at 2 o'clock in the morning from Tulane University. They just said, any traffic from Tulane University? Forget it. <laughs> we're no longer around traffic from Tulane University. Uh, and it wasn't long after that that I got a call from the, the university's Office of Information Technology. They had gotten a complaint about me from a different shop bot. You know, and uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of a call you don't really want to have. It's someone from the university saying you're doing something abusive. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Turns out that the, uh, they really thought that I was like a competitor. They had done all this work to get these prices, and then someone else like piggybacking off of their data, collecting the data once a day, and then using that you know, for some other study. So I'm on, actually, by that time, I collected enough data, so I just quit. But um, a couple, about two years later, I was I, I had done enough other things that got me in trouble, that I thought, you know, maybe we should tell other researchers what they should avoid you know, doing. So I was writing a paper about that. And I noticed that ISBNU had unblocked me. So I like wrote an email, you know, webmaster at ISBN.nu. Hey, a couple years ago I was doing this. I was kind of just didn't realize that what I was doing was kind of abusive. And I just wanted to apologize. And like within 10 minutes, the guy responded, Oh, if I had known you were doing academic research, I wouldn't have turned you off. In fact, I've got all this data that you might be interested in, and I just throw it away, you know, like every month. Do you want it? <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so it's really interesting. What I found out is that, you know, when you're doing something that someone might view as competitive on their site, they really want you to quit. Um, but at least in the space where this is something that you know, we're doing, this is learning and furthering research, they're like, yeah, the way to do it. it's, not, it's not too bad. And I just thought you were a competitor. They want you to do it. So. All right, folks, thanks for coming. Uh, that concludes class for today. I will see you on Monday. Oh, wait a minute. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Monday, we've got a project due. Monday, there is also a homework due. Homework still due. So, take a look at that. All right, thanks for coming. Class dismissed.